The book of Isaiah has some of the best known verses in the entire Hebrew Bible, such as, The nations shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And, One angel cried unto another, and said, in Hebrew, Kadosh, 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 Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. While it is easy to quote individual verses from Isaiah, reading through the entire book is a different matter. Isaiah is 66 chapters long, and at times it's not clear where one idea ends and another begins. The Hebrew can be difficult. And finally, there is the issue of chronology. In some passages, Isaiah speaks to the Israelites of the 8th century BCE. When the Assyrians were in charge, while in other passages he speaks to Israelites from the 6th to 5th centuries when the Babylonians and then the Persians were in charge. I remember the first time I studied Isaiah, I got lost, I gave up, and I shelved it for a later date. 66 chapters is a lot to read if you don't know the lay of the land. Luckily, there is a hypothesis that explains the chronology of the book of Isaiah. And for our purposes, I will call it the Three Isaiahs Hypothesis. I'm going to introduce you to this hypothesis and show you how it neatly divides the book of Isaiah into three sections. Also, since not everyone accepts all or even part of the hypothesis, at the end I will show you some of the different approaches out there for studying the book. So let's begin. The Three Isaiahs Hypothesis can be traced back to one of my all-time favorite interpreters, the 11th to 12th century Abraham Ibn Ezra. Ibn Ezra felt that the book of Isaiah was targeted to three different audiences. The first was the Israelites of the First Temple period. The second was the Israelites of the Exile and Second Temple period. And the third was directed to those living in the end of days. While Ibn Ezra suggests that these three prophecies had three authors, he realized this was a radical idea and did not want to write it explicitly. He simply hints, Hamas Gileavin, the wise person will understand, meaning the wise person will understand that the book of Isaiah was written by multiple authors. Six centuries later, the Three Isaiahs hypothesis reappeared in the writings of a few scholars, such as Johann Christoph Doderlein, a German Protestant theologian who in 1775 suggested that the book of Isaiah was written by two prophets, an eighth century prophet who would come to be called First Isaiah and an unnamed, anonymous 6th century prophet who would come to be called Deutero-Isaiah, or 2nd Isaiah. Over a century after Doderlein, in 1892, another German Protestant theologian named Bernard Doom identified a third prophet of the late 6th century, also anonymous, that he named Trito-Isaiah, or 3rd Isaiah. By the end of the 1800s, the idea of a 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Isaiah had completely infiltrated biblical studies. Let's take a look at 1st Isaiah the famous Yeshayahu ben Amotz, Isaiah, son of Amos. This prophet's writings comprise most of the first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah. First Isaiah's message is specific to the 8th century BCE, that is the first temple period. To illustrate what I mean by this, let's look at first Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 7 to 8. Here God sends Isaiah, son of Amotz, with his son to speak to King Ahaz in Jerusalem. Ahaz is worried. The text says his heart wavered like a tree in the wind. The reason Ahaz is so worried is that two nations have teamed up against him to the north, the kingdoms of Aram and northern Israel. God's message to Ahaz via Isaiah is not to worry. These two nations will be taken care of in due time. Rather than conquering Jerusalem, we are told that the riches of Damascus, which is the capital of Aram, and the spoils of Samaria, which is the capital of northern Israel, will be taken away before the king of Assyria. The Assyrians did in fact conquer and exile these two kingdoms in the 730s and 720s. This entire passage takes place in the 8th century. There is a king in Jerusalem, which also means that the first temple is still standing. Isaiah son of Amoz is alive, and his prophecy only makes sense because Assyria is still a superpower, and the kingdoms of Aram and northern Israel have not yet been conquered. In other words, 1st Isaiah is about an 8th century prophet who is concerned with 8th century peoples and events. There is one more feature of 1st Isaiah to mention. The name Isaiah appears 16 times in the first 39 chapters of the book. The name Isaiah does not appear even once after chapter 39. 
So, according to the hypothesis, the first 39 chapters concern the original Isaiah, that is, Yeshayahu ben Amos, Isaiah son of Amos. The next 27 chapters, which do not even mention the name Isaiah, are not by or about that prophet. Those chapters were written anonymously by one or more people, perhaps the followers of the original prophet. This now brings us two centuries later to 2nd Isaiah, which can be found in chapters 40 to 55. In 586 BCE, the Babylonians destroyed the temple in Jerusalem and exiled many Judeans to Babylon. A half century after that, the Persian king Cyrus II, commonly known as Cyrus the Great, conquered Babylon and took control of the land of Israel. We are now two centuries removed from the start of 1st Isaiah. Cyrus was benevolent and allowed the exiles to return from Babylon and begin work on the second temple. As it turns out, Cyrus is mentioned twice in 2nd Isaiah. He is called God's shepherd in 4428 because he brings back the exiles like a shepherd brings back the sheep that have strayed. Cyrus is even called God's anointed one in 45.1, Mashiach in Hebrew, which became Messiah in English, a term that was once applied to another great king, King David. Once we understand that 2nd Isaiah is about the end of the exile in the 6th century, the different prophecies begin to make sense. To illustrate this, let's look at two statements from chapter 48. In verse 14, 2 Isaiah says something mysterious. The Lord loves him. He shall do his pleasure on Babylon, and his arm shall be against the Chaldeans. Who is this person who will take vengeance on Babylon? The answer is King Cyrus, who sacked Babylon in 539 BCE and turned it into a province. This passage now makes sense. Moving on, in verse 20, we are told, Go forth from Babylon, flee from the Chaldeans with a voice of singing. Here, Second Isaiah is addressing the Babylonian exiles who had returned to their homeland, built the city of Jerusalem, and rebuilt the temple. Second Isaiah is essentially saying to them, Hey, you're free. Pick up your belongings and go back home. The exile is over. Now that we've seen Second Isaiah in chapters 40 to 55, let's take a look at Third Isaiah in chapters 56 to 66. While 2nd Isaiah spoke about the return of the Israelites to their homeland, 3rd Isaiah assumes that these Israelites had already returned, and they had already rebuilt the temple. Let's take a look. In chapter 56, God makes a promise about the exiles. I will gather to Israel even more than those already gathered to it. According to this statement, a great deal of exiles have already returned. All that God intends to do is bring back more exiles, the stragglers that remained. In the same passage, God opens the temple up to the infertile and the foreign-born. These groups will be given honor within the temple for their observance of the Sabbath, the Shabbat. Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. The assumption is that the temple is already built. It's kind of like inviting someone over to your home for dinner. All you have to do is make dinner for them, not build your home first. For 3rd Isaiah, the temple is already standing. The only question is, who should have access to it? Are the infertile welcome? What about foreigners? In this respect, 3rd Isaiah takes place at least a few decades after 2nd Isaiah, which considered the temple to be a future event. <music> this, we now completely understand the three Isaiah's hypothesis. When we look at the entire book of Isaiah, there are actually three parts. First Isaiah, chapters 1 to 39, come from Yeshaya ben Amoz, the 8th century prophet Isaiah, son of Amoz. He was squarely in the first temple period and was concerned with the foreign nation of Assyria. This section mentions the name Isaiah 16 times. The next section, second Isaiah, consists of chapters 40 to 55. This comes from an anonymous prophet of the 6th century. This was the exilic period when the Babylonians were in charge and then finally the Persians conquered them and took over. And that's why this section mentions the name of Cyrus two times. 
Moving on to the third section, third Isaiah, in chapters 56 to 66. This also comes from an anonymous prophet from the late 6th to early 5th centuries, which is in the Second Temple period. At this time, the Persians were also in control. While this division is really nice, neat, and clean, you should just be aware that throughout the book of Isaiah, there are paragraphs or even chapters that certain scholars attribute to a different source. But that's really complicated, and I didn't want to get into it here. But just a heads up, you might be reading 1st Isaiah and then come across something that really sounds like it belongs in 2nd or 3rd Isaiah. Now that we understand what the three Isaiah hypothesis looks like, let's take a look at a few alternative approaches. I'll begin with what I call the two Isaiahs hypothesis, which says that there was no third Isaiah whatsoever. Second and quote unquote third Isaiah were actually written by one person or perhaps one group of people working together. The difference in time between second and third Isaiah, that is the time from Cyrus's decree to the time of the construction of the temple is only 23 years at the shortest or a few decades at the longest, which can easily be covered by one individual. Perhaps more importantly, the two sections have similar styles, vocabularies, and themes. For one example of this approach, check out Benjamin Somers' A Prophet Reads Scripture, which assumes that there was only a first and second Isaiah. The book even has an appendix titled, Was There a Trito Isaiah?, which addresses this issue directly. Another approach is to challenge the idea of multiple authors. This can often be found in more traditional commentaries. For example, in his 1984 commentary on Isaiah, the late Amos Chacham attributed the entire book of Isaiah to just one person, Yeshaya ben Amotz, Isaiah son of Amotz of the 8th century. All the book's words Chacham wrote gush from the same source. For Chacham, prophets could look deep into the future. The prophets spoke their words for the needs of the moment and for the needs of future generations. While the first 39 chapters were targeted to Isaiah's contemporaries, Chapters 40 to 66 were the equivalent of a time capsule, written for an era long after Isaiah died. For one last approach, Pierre D. Quinn Miscal writes in his 2001 book, Reading Isaiah, There is one book, one Isaiah, and not three. Therefore, I do not refer to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Isaiah. Like Chacham, there is one author. But unlike Chacham, the author looks backwards in times, not forward. I assume a 5th or even 4th century BCE date and therefore read the entire book as a retrospective on Israel's history from the mid-8th century to the end of the 6th century. According to this approach, the entirety of Isaiah comes from the Second Temple period. While this is the last approach, there are actually many, many others you can take, but I showed you these three because I felt that they gave you a good lay of the land for interpreting the book of Isaiah in a way different from the traditional three Isaiahs hypothesis. That is, looking at two Isaiahs, or even one Isaiah looking forwards, or one Isaiah looking backwards. So, all in all, we have seen how the book of Isaiah contains passages about the first temple period, the exilic period ended by Cyrus, and the second temple period. No matter which approach you take, the three Isaiahs hypothesis, the two, the one, hopefully this analysis has brought some clarity to the issues involved in studying this complex book. At the very least, my hope is that you take Isaiah off the shelf as I did, open it up, and read some of the most powerful passages in the entire Bible. If you enjoy this type of study, consider taking a class with me and other great instructors at biblicalculture.org. A good place to start would be our Isaiah course, of course, which is what led to this video. And if you enjoy these videos, please consider supporting our mission on Patreon, where I can send you a signed copy of my book. Thanks for watching, and see you next time. Thank you.